full of grace, Lord is with you. Bless that thou among women, bless that thou among women. can say is if you think that's scary, you ought to see the rest of the movie. <laughs> this morning, we continue in our series called Turbulence, where we've been talking over these past few weeks about what we're supposed to do when we find ourselves in the midst of great personal, community, even national uncertainty. And I want to begin today by showing you a verse from Psalm 33, and I really would like us to memorize this verse. It's a short verse, but I think it's a really, really important one. In fact, why don't you say this with me? Psalm 33, 22, say it with me. May your unfailing love be with us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, I, I, I realize that that may not seem like a big deal to you, but that's a really, really foundational verse in terms of our relationship with God. So let's say it again. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, I wanna to talk to you today about hope. And specifically, I wanna talk about the tension of trying to maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world. And, and let me throw out some scenarios to make sure that we're all kind of thinking along the same lines. If you've ever placed your hope in something or someone, and that something came crashing down, or that someone let you down, then you understand this tension we're talking about. If you ever stood at an altar and said, till death do us part, and then he or she decided it wasn't going to be until death, it was gonna be until someone else came along and your marriage came crashing down around you, and you felt that sense of utter helplessness and hopelessness, you understand what it means to manage this tension. Maybe you had aspirations for your son or your daughter, but right now they are everything other than what you hoped for them to be. But you can't go back and give them their teenage years. You can't go back and give them their first year in college. And so you look at them and you think, it just seems hopeless. You're managing that tension of how do we maintain hope in what seems to be a hopelessly broken world. Now, let me tell you, if you have not found yourself managing that tension in life yet, just get ready because it is coming. But if you ever found yourself saying, you know, why try? Why even go on? Why study? Why apply myself? Why even show up? If you've ever thought to yourself, what's the point of loving when people treat you that way? What's the point of committing when people's commitments don't seem to mean anything? What's the point of investing years in a company or a business when that company doesn't seem to wanna invest anything in you? If you've ever found yourself saying, what exactly is the point, you have bumped into the inevitable question, how do you maintain hope in a world that seems to be hopelessly broken? And that's why today I wanna to talk a little bit about hope when it comes to turbulence. Now, as we begin this discussion, I wanna give you sort of a working definition of hope. Basically, I want you to think of hope in terms of any person or thing in which your expectations are centered, okay? Let me say that again. Any person or thing in which your expectations are centered. Your hope is in that relationship. It's in that company. It's in a profession. It's in your ability. It's in your looks, in your life, you have centered your expectations on something. 
I also want you to think of hope as a little bit like a ladder. And you may have heard me use this illustration before, but a ladder that we lean up against a wall. In life, we lean our ladder against something. And that something holds us up and therefore justifies our hope in it. Now, the interesting thing is, none of us were really conscious of this process, but when you were born, you automatically leaned your ladder of hope up against someone. Anybody wanna guess who that someone or someones was? When you were born, you leaned your ladder of hope against your parents, right? And so your hope for your future had everything to do with your parents' willingness to care for you. And it wasn't even a conscious decision if you think about it. But then as you get older, you begin to move your ladder from someone else's commitment to perhaps maybe your ability to begin taking care of yourself. And that's why teenagers uh, sometimes become a little bit rebellious, okay? Because they're trying to break free of leaning the ladder against their parents and they're starting to recognize there's something natural in them that says, I need to lean my ladder against my own thing. Does that make sense? And so that begins to happen as we get older. As you get older and older, you begin to move your ladder from, from one commitment to another, your ability to connect, your ability to get a scholarship, your ability to maintain relationships, to attract attention. Maybe your ability to marry somebody who had promise. And so all of us from time to time at different stages of life have made the decision, we're going to lean our ladder against something that we think will support our hopes and our dreams for the future. But again, most of the time we're not even aware that we're doing it. And the only time we think about hope, listen to this, is when we begin to feel hopeless. Isn't that interesting? And that happens when that thing that I've leaned my ladder against isn't coming through for me. I, that thing I've leaned my ladder against starts to get shaky. That thing that I move my ladder against, actually it's a, supposed to be a wall, but instead it begins to move. Have you ever been on a ladder that began to move? That is a shaky, sh that's, you wanna talk about turbulence. That's a, that's a scary situation, right? And so what, what happens is that that thing I've leaned my ladder against, I begin to realize it's not coming through for me. And you begin to experience the emotions of, it's not gonna happen for me. We're not gonna have children when we thought we would have children. I'm, I'm gonna be 40 and I'm still gonna be single. I'm not gonna be able to retire when I thought I would be able to retire. See, it's only when the thing we've leaned our ladder up against comes crashing down that we begin to realize maybe we've leaned our ladder up against something that's not as secure as we thought it should be. And I'm telling you, all of us, every person in this room, we have a ladder of hope leaned up against something and the question is, how do you maintain hope in a world that is hopelessly broken? Now, when you open your Bible, and, and I know this is such preacher talk, this isn't gonna take you by any kind of surprise, but when you open up your Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we are instructed to place our hope in, any guesses? To God, right? That's where the Bible says we should lean our ladder of hope. We lean it against a God who has invited us to call him father. And so the verse that, that we looked at a few minutes ago, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You realize what that means? It means, God, I place my ladder. I lean my ladder against you, oh God. Now, of course, you expect the preacher to say that, right? Right? And of course we expect the Bible to say that, but the reality is whether you've been a Christian your whole life or whether you're brand new to this, all of us, especially in the United States, I believe, have a really hard time with the idea of putting our hope in God. 
And again, the reason we have a hard time is that we're the best in the world at creating walls that hold us up pretty good. Does that make sense? Because we believe if we have the right education, this ladder is going to hold. If we work hard enough, this ladder is going to hold. If you've got the right connections and you marry well and you save well and you're disciplined and you just say no to drugs and if you persevere and you know all the cliches, if you do all of that right, this ladder is going to hold in our life. And so we do everything in our power to put our hope in things that we can control. Things that we actually create ourselves, things that we've been taught to place our hope in, in hopes that the latter will hold. And then if you're a Christian, just for luck, you say, dear God, please don't let my ladder fall, right? God, please don't let my ladder shake. Please don't let it fall. God, I, 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 you know, here's the deal. I think I found a solid place to lean my ladder. And oh Lord, I'd really like you to help me out. I need you to come through for me in terms of this ladder. I need you to make this thing work for me. In Jesus' name, amen. And God's saying through scripture and through wise people around you, look, I don't care how smart you are, how careful you are, how connected you are. I don't care what you own or who you know. At some point, you're gonna find out that you live in a hopelessly broken world. And you can try and you can be careful and you can plan and you can invest well and you can get a great education, but at some point in your life, you will begin to recognize that nothing is secure in this world. Can I get like an amen to that? Do you live in the same world I live in? I mean, especially if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, you're looking at your kids, you're looking at your, at your grandchildren, you want them to know, do you not? You need them to know. Nothing in this world is secure, no matter what you've been told. Now, that's pretty depressing, but I'm here for some good news, aren't you? So Romans chapter eight, if you've got your Bibles, Romans chapter eight, uh, got your message notes inside your Bible as well, use those to follow with us. The Apostle Paul explains where our hope should be, what our hope should be leaned up against. But more importantly for our discussion, he explains the futility for any of us of leaning our ladder up against anything that has anything to do with the temporary nature of this world. Paul begins his teaching in Romans 8 by going all the way back to the beginning and he draws on an event in Genesis that's typically referred to as the fall of man. It's the story about how sin entered the world. And you know, when we think about sin, we usually think, of sin more like an incident, like that thing you did was sin, right? Or that attitude you had, that was sinful. But the Bible views sin a little differently, surprisingly. The Bible teaches that sin entered the world as a fatal disease that impacted everything and everyone. Relationships, the animal kingdom, nature, the weather, I, you've probably heard me say this before. Do you realize the reason Oklahoma has tornadoes is because of sin? I don't have time to explain all that to you, but it goes back to Genesis, okay? And, and, and what this means, this idea of this fatal disease, it means according to Genesis, everything that's living is going to die. And scripture teaches that the reason everything in the world dies is because sin has polluted and corrupted everything. And that is Paul's basis for the argument that it is always a bad decision. Listen to me. It is always a bad decision to put all of your hope in things that pertain to this world. And so that's where we begin in Romans 8, verse 20. Here we go. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Let me say that again. For creation was subjected to frustration. Did you know that the reason you experience 
or, or your experience in this world can be so frustrating is because of sin. That's why you feel frustration in this life. You say things like, well, you know, why won't those kids fill in the blank? Why doesn't my boss fill in the blank? Why can't people see the world the way I see the world? I just get so frustrated. Paul says, welcome to the world because sin enters the world as a fatal disease that impacts every single thing and God has allowed it to run its course. God has allowed sin to run its course in this temporary world. You see, when, when sin entered the world, God said, I'm gonna let it go like a wave. I'm gonna let it touch everything, impact everything, corrupt everything. As a result, Paul says, creation was subject to frustration. He goes on in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration in hopes that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay. In summary, he says, God let the world decay so that we wouldn't stay in love with the world. Does that make any kind of sense? Like, like it's hard to be in love with something that's in decay. If you've got a tooth that is in decay, it, it hurts and it probably needs to be taken out. And he's saying, I don't want you to fall in love with that tooth. I, Dan Wilgus is sitting in front of me. The, the illustration just came to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If you could, could you set up a couple of rows or suit closer in the future? I appreciate that. Everything in the world is decaying and we're not supposed to be in love with it. And, and I think we sort of know that that is the case. When you reach a certain age and, and uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't know about you, but, but we're getting to the age where you look in the mirror. Do you ever just like do a double take in the mirror? And you're like, ooh, what is that? What, what, is, what is that right there? What is that? that? You know what that is? That's the bondage to decay that you're seeing in the mirror. If you're like me, you're like, something is wrong with me. Nah, that's just bondage to decay. And it's kind of funny, it's not very encouraging, but this is the case that Paul's building. Everything is, is decaying, including your relationships, your wealth. Everything ultimately has the look and the smell of decay. But again, because we're Americans, we got a different approach to this deal, right? We're thinking, by golly, I'm not gonna decay. I can have surgery. I'm, I'm not gonna decay. I can get educated. I, I'm not gonna decay. I can study harder. I, I'm not gonna decay. Here's my favorite. I'm gonna be careful. And here's the biggest one. I'm not gonna decay. I'm gonna do good, right? I mean, surely... If I do enough good, there's a way around this bondage to decay thing, right? But at the end of the day, the reality is we're all in bondage to decay and nothing, not even hard work or good deeds is going to change that. Let me put it to you this way. If I were to make a list of people who had done the most good in the world, who were famous for doing good and therefore they probably ought to get a pass on being in bondage to decay. Would you agree with me that Mother Teresa should be on that list? You guys know who Mother Teresa is? Very famous for her care and compassion, uh, taking care of lepers in Calcutta. I mean, she dedicated her whole life to it. She became famous for it. But did you know that in 1997, Mother Teresa died. You're saying, what? That, that can't be right. Mother Teresa can't die. I mean, look at all the good she did. But as much good as she did in this world, do you know what happened to her body? Her amazing, you know, intimidatingly pure body that housed this awesome heart and this compassionate brain this love for people, do you know what happened to her body? It died. Listen, 
if Mother Teresa couldn't beat the odds, if she couldn't win, if she couldn't beat the system, I've got bad news for all of you people, okay? All right? Think about somebody, I don't know, in the political realm. Um, FDR, Ronald Reagan, they both died. Go through history. Pick out whatever person represents the most good done in the world that you think they shouldn't die. They should get some kind of a pass. They did so much good. Billy Graham died. The world was a better place because they were born. Paul says, you need to understand, sin entered the world as a fatal disease that impacted everything and everyone, and God allowed it to run its course. As a result, as a result, we live in a world that is in bondage to decay. Okay? Now, you say, Justin, I hope this is going somewhere happy. Right? Hang on, we're almost there. We're almost to the good news, I promise. Paul goes on in verse 22, and he says this. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, Paul says there is this tension of creation being in bondage to decay, but this tension creates in us a longing for something better. This tension in us creates this thought, there's got to be something more than all of this. And it forces us to look outside the world we live in, which is in bondage to decay, to some other time and to some other place and to some other way. Listen to verse 24. For in this hope, we were saved. In other words, it's this hope for something new, good, better, that leads us to desire salvation from God. Wow. Then in verse 25, we find the transition point in his argument. He says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently, which I might argue, you know, that's an assumption on your part, Paul. I'm not all that great at waiting patiently for anything, but here's what I think he means. What he means is we don't get everything we want right now, right this minute. But we do not give up hope. Do you see it? We don't get everything we want right now, but we don't give up hope. And the hope we have is not in this world. And Our hope cannot be this life that we're living because this life will always ultimately disappoint us. And this life we're living will always ultimately end. He says, Christian, there's hope. There is hope. Christian, you have something to look forward to. Christian, you have something to wait patiently for. It's just not in this world. Then in verses 26 to 30, he basically explains that God actually understands your frustration and your disappointment. And God understands that your ladder falls, you know, every once in a while. He says that God so understands this, that his Holy Spirit prays for you. Think about that. And his Holy Spirit prays for me with words that cannot even be uttered with groanings, depending on your translation. And let me tell you something. If you've ever been in the pit of despair, if you've ever hit rock bottom in terms of hopelessness, you know exactly what that's like. To get on your face or to lay in bed, pull the covers over your head, and just groan because there's nothing that can be done to make this thing better. And God says, I'm telling you, I understand that. I understand the pointlessness this world seems to offer sometimes. I understand 
that sense of isolation you feel. I understand all of that and I have provided a solution to it. Then Paul turns a corner, verse 31. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? Check this out. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The point being, as God becomes the focus of your hope, as you center your expectations in the love of your heavenly father, he says that is where hope does not disappoint. Then skip down to verse 38. Here's the big finish. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future, not any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. And, and we could write in, we could fill in the blanks with job loss, divorce, when am I gonna be able to retire? What's gonna happen with my kids? How can we possibly afford to pay these bills? He says, none of that, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? I mean, wow, come on. That's something to get excited about. He says, look, you wanna put your hope in something secure? You wanna put your hope in something that will not disappoint? You wanna put your hope in something that you can go to every single time? He says, you've got to move your ladder. You've got to lean it up against your heavenly father for only there will you find enduring hope. Now, like we asked a couple of weeks ago, okay, but what does that mean in the meantime? Right? I mean, I, okay, I get it. I need, to, I need to, to lean my ladder up against God. I need to trust him. He's the only thing that's secure. But in the meantime, I got all this stuff going on. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know what to do about that. What do I do in the meantime? Well, here's what it means. I want you to hear me. It means that in the meantime, yeah, you do your best. You work hard. You get educated. You do good. It means that you live out kingdom values in a world where there honestly aren't a lot of happy endings, are there? It means that you love like crazy. But when you don't get loved back, you don't lose hope because your hope wasn't there to begin with. It means you serve like crazy and when no one serves you back, you don't lose hope because your hope wasn't there to begin with. It means you forgive like crazy. And when people don't forgive you back or you don't get the benefit of forgiveness, you don't lose hope because you never placed your hope there anyway. Now, do you plan? Of course you plan. Do you have ambition? Of course you have ambition. Do you leverage your talents and your skills? Of course you do all of that. Do you build things? Do you pursue progress? Do you save? Do you learn? Do you love? Do you engage culture? Yes, you do all of that. But do you place your hope in any of that? Paul says no. He says, like Jesus, like the apostle Paul, like Mother Teresa, you love people like crazy and you do your best and you use your God-given talents to accomplish everything you can. But at the end of the day, you say, along with all of that and despite all of that, my hope is in my heavenly father. That is where I lean my ladder. Amen? It means you go to bed at night and you say to God, God, this was an awesome day. It all went perfect and wrinkle-free. No bird even pooped on my car. But still, my hope is in you. And it also means that some nights, listen to me, you go to bed and you say, God, this was a terrible day. 
Nobody called me back. I didn't sell anything today. I'm still as jobless as I was yesterday. I still don't know how we're gonna pay the bills. It was a terrible day, God. But my hope is in you. Here's the truth. When we loosen our grip on our plans, treasures, and ambitions, our plans, treasures, and ambitions loosen their grip on us. And when those things loosen their grip on us, guess what happens? We're able to move our ladder. Because when I loosen my hands from all these things I have hope in, only then am I able to transfer my hope to the only person, to the only thing that can truly sustain me through both the good and the bad. May your unfailing love, O oh God, demonstrated when Jesus died on the cross for me. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we move our ladder and as we place our hope in you. See, here's the truth. I want so bad for you to get. Whatever it is that you've placed your hope in will determine whether you remain hopeful in a world that is hopelessly broken. So, where are you leaning your ladder? Where are you leaning your ladder? Where have you placed your hope? What are you hoping for? Is your ladder leaned up against something that's in bondage to decay? Does that seem like a good idea? Or is your ladder leaned up against the only thing in this world that is un? failing. You know, I went to Falls Creek. I can't even count the years, how many years ago it was the first time I went. We're getting ready to go to Falls Creek in a couple of weeks. Deadline next Sunday, by the way. I went to Falls Creek, and I'll be honest with you, I've been in church most of my life. I'd, I'd heard the stories. I knew the, the you know, the, the parables, and, and I, I knew all that stuff, but I'd never really heard the gospel and I'm telling you, when it was all said and done, when I became a Christian, that last night of Falls Creek, the thing that really changed for me is I realized I've got my ladder leaned up against anything in the world, everything in the world except what is really going to make a change for me, make a difference for me. Does that make sense? I had it leaned up against all this stuff, and it wasn't going to save me? Where have you centered your expectations? I'm asking you, teenager. I'm asking you, adult. Where have you centered your expectations? And I'm telling you, if they're anywhere other than God's love for you and a love relationship with your heavenly father, understand it is misplaced hope. And it is a hope that eventually, ultimately will disappoint you. You see, the only way to maintain hope in a hopelessly broken world is to place your hope in the unfailing love of God, demonstrated in one place at one specific moment in history when Jesus Christ himself allowed himself to be crucified for your sins, which potentially sealed your eternity forever. And if you'll accept him as Savior, it locked you into a relationship with God that Paul says cannot be broken by anything in this broken, uncertain, turbulent, hopeless world. And it's my prayer for you that as, as we continue to face turbulent times, and we're going to, aren't we? As we continue to face turbulence, as the latter continues shaking and maybe moving and shifting and maybe even falling, that we'd be reminded we, won't, we weren't supposed to put our hope here anyway. And hopefully things will get better. And hopefully things turn around. And hopefully you do get a fresh new start. But in spite of what happens here, our hope can remain strong because we have been invited to place our hope in God's unfailing love for us. Heavenly Father, 
How many ways can we say thank you for your love for us? How many ways can we say thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross? God, this morning we recognize you didn't create this world for sin. You created a perfect world. But as human beings, we're the ones who broke it. We're the ones who messed it up. And you very, very easily could have just left us to rot and decay. You could have done that. You probably should have done that. But you loved us too much. And so you made a way out of this world. God, may we never lean our ladder against things that are in decay. May we lean our ladder against you in the turbulent times, in the uncertain times, in the scary times, and every single day of our life. I pray for somebody here this morning that might recognize, oh my goodness, I've got my ladder leaned up against something all right. It's not God. It's something I created. It's something somebody else told me I should lean my ladder against and Today, I want to begin to think about what it would mean to let go of that and to shift that ladder to lean against you, God, to trust in you. You're the only thing that is a solid rock, and I want to be leaned against you. I pray for Christians that we would understand how ridiculous it is for us to center our hope on temporary rotten things. God, help us to see how much we need you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? Let's take a few moments. I hope hope I've given you something to think about this morning. And I hope that the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart, challenging you to be obedient to your heavenly father. As Lindsay leads us, let's sing and let's worship and let's rejoice. But as we do that, let's pray and let's ask God how we can be obedient to him this morning.